Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and I have just a couple of quick announcements. The first one is that advanced study uh, classes in August are going to be on Mammography, Truth, Lies and Controversy by Peter Gotchke. Um, this is a marvelous book. The problem with it, if you want to call it that, is it is technical. A lot of people look at it. It's expensive and they say, I'm not going to spend $70 on this book and it looks hard to read. So I'm going to distill it all down for you and you'll have slides and written stuff and you'll understand exactly what it says. So anyway, that's coming up in August. And then our uh, posting this week is going to be on our member site is a video on quick and effective workouts for weight loss with our super trainer, Chris Dorka. So make sure you log on and take a look at that. All right, I have more stuff from Dr. Esselstyn. Um, I, last week I covered the article reporting the 198 patients, but he has another article in uh, the journal Experimental and Clinical Cardiology which is wonderful. Uh, he and his co-authors write about the power of plant-based nutrition for patients with coronary artery disease, and they give three case reports to document their stance. The case reports describe patients who essentially um, had, had the very best cardiology has to offer, were sent home as hopeless cases, and um, no hope for a healthier future. And as um, Dr. Esselstyn reports, and not surprising for those of us who have been following his work for a long time, very quick response to a low-fat plant-based diet. So I'll back up a little bit. In addition to the case reports, Dr. Esselstyn addresses um, a couple of things I think are real important. One of them is the mechanisms of action by which eating animal foods injure uh, blood vessels and lead to cardiovascular disease. And then the other is mythology associated with HDL cholesterol. Lots of misunderstandings there. So I'm gonna share some highlights with you because I think it's real important. The first point he makes about the diet's effect is that animal foods injure blood vessels through interaction with gut bacteria. And I had uh, covered this study that he references um, probably a year or two ago, basically showing that intestinal bacteria in humans left, uh, metabolize lecithin and carnitine, hard word to pronounce sometimes, from animal foods into a substance called TMAO, which promotes injuries to blood vessels. Research shows that higher TMAO levels are associated with a two and a half fold, 2.5 fold increase in the risk of major cardiovascular events. Even more interesting is that people who eat a plant-based diet and take carnitine supplements, carnitine being the primary precursor to TMAO, um, don't show um, uh, this effect. So it's definitely the animal foods that are doing it, not necessarily carnitine, which um, when eating a plant-based diet, you don't get the same response. Now on this HDL issue, this is very important and I don't think a week goes by that I don't answer this question for two or three people. He addresses this misconception that we have to strive to have higher HDL levels and he says plant-based diets lower total and LDL cholesterol and HDL cholesterol comes right down with it. Most doctors, many if not most, insist that HDL cholester cholesterol supports cardiovascular health, but research shows that having higher levels doesn't necessarily result in better health outcomes. Um, studies do show that a diet high in animal foods causes oxidative damage to the main protein of the HDL molecule, which makes it incapable of performing anti-inflammatory functions that would be cardioprotective. And research also shows that it's not the amount of HDL cholesterol, but its ability to do something called performing reverse cholesterol transport, in other words, getting LDL cholesterol out of the bloodstream. And so it's not important that the number be high, it's important that the HDL be active, and there is some um, research showing that animal foods interfere with this as well. On the other hand, people who eat plant-based diets have, of course, lower risks of coronary artery disease, um, but if you look at populations around the world where the incidence of heart disease is very low, you'll see HDL levels that are very low. And I love Dr. Esselstyn's line, he uses this in some of his lectures, that uh, people like the Tarahumara Indians and the Papua New Guineans, their HDL cholesterol is between 14 and 24 milligrams per deciliter. He says it would make the average American cardiologist apoplectic. So anyway, a little bit of understanding there I think is important. Another mechanism is uh, based on the fact that eating plant foods, particularly leafy green vegetables, has been shown to increase the pro uh, production of something called endothelial pro progenitor cells, which are produced in the bone marrow. Now this is really important because these cells replace injure, injured endothelial cells in the blood vessels. So one of the functions of endothelial cells is pumping out nitric oxide, which keeps those vessels open and allows for easy blood flow. 
Now I'll move on to the case studies. Those are the, the mechanisms of action that he outlines, he and his co-authors outline in the paper. His case studies show the amazing contrast between the failures of traditional medical treatment and the power of plant-based diets. All three patients were told by their doctors there was nothing else that could be done, essentially sending them home to continue disease progression until they would die, most certainly a premature death. On the other hand, these hopeless cases, as they're referred to, experienced an amazing and rapid recovery just by adopting a low-fat plant-based diet. And the recovery wasn't just limited to coronary artery disease. One person was diabetic and the diabetes went away and all three of those patients lost weight. Dr. Esselstyn makes a really important couple of points at the end of the article when he says, the obvious question is why did these men, presumably having the best of cardiovascular care, have to strike out on their own to find answers for their progressive illness. And that is true. Why do people have to go figure this out on their own and their doctors aren't telling them this stuff? He quotes Dr. Thomas Pearson when he's, and this is what Pearson had, had to say, the participation of a cardiologist in the general field of risk analysis and reduction has been variable and is, considering the state of current knowledge, fundamentally unsatisfactory. Well, that's a whole mouthful that basically says, it isn't working, we need to do something else. Dr. Esselstyn concludes with this statement, all patients in a non-emergency situation should be offered the option of plant-based nutrition to halt and reverse their disease by practitioners who are knowledgeable with this approach. The present standard cardiology approach cannot cure patients nor halt disease development and is financially unsustainable. The tools are available to end the epidemic of vascular disease. And if you've ever heard Dr. Esselstyn's talk before or you saw Forks Over Knives, you might remember he, he says all the time, he says it in his book too, heart disease need not exist. And if it does exist, it does not need to progress. And that's the bottom line. So two fabulous articles, the one I covered last week and this one, um, really inspiring, makes us all want to go out and tell people about this. Now, while we're on the subject of heart disease, I want to talk about another encouraging thing. Dr. Esselstyn's stuff is always encouraging. It wakes people up when they see the stuff in the journals. But uh, even some traditional doctors are starting to question traditional cardiology. So John Mandrola is a cardiac electrophysiologist. This is a cardiologist who specializes in irregular heart rhythms. And um, he writes a blog about uh, news and that sort of thing. And uh, he also is a contributor to Medscape. And so anyway, he posted this article that I think is wonderful. He says that doctors need to rethink um, he says, I'm growing increasingly worried about the irrational exuberance over these drugs, meaning statin drugs, especially when used for prevention of heart disease that is yet to happen. So he's concerned about statins. He says that doctors need to rethink their strategies and start focus more on treating people than treating disease and biomarkers. He says the data does not support the use of statins when we look at absolute versus relative numbers. I talk about this all the time. For example, let me tell you how bad it is. When statins are taken by patients for primary prevention, there's no drop in mortality rates regardless of how much you lower cholesterol with the drugs. There's a very small drop in the risk of future events like stroke and heart attack, but it's small. You have to have 140 people taking statins for five years to prevent one event. And what that really translates to in statistical terms, 99.3% of patients who take statins don't get any benefit from taking them. On the other hand, they increase they have all kinds of side effects, ranging from muscle myopathy to increased risk of diabetes. And in fact, the increased risk of diabetes, diabetes offsets the reduction in risk in events. You get about a 1% reduction in risk of events and about a 1% increased risk of diabetes. So add to this the fact that there's never been an independent review of raw data from industry-sponsored studies on cholesterol-lowering drugs, and it is really hard to make an argument for prescribing them. Mandrola also references recent studies showing the licensing effect caused by taking statins. In these studies, people taking statins ate more calories, ate more fat, gained more weight, and exercised less than people not taking statins. And I've written about this licensing effect too. It's very interesting, this idea of people do something that they think is good, and it gives them the privilege to go do something or a whole bunch of some things that aren't so good. Mandrella says we need to ask why all of this reduction in cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, hasn't resulted in more benefit and health outcomes. And he offers a couple of potential answers, one being that maybe cholesterol is not a good predictor of risk, and I don't agree with that. 
I think it is, I think what we have to acknowledge is that all methods for lowering cholesterol are not equal. So um, in the case where we use drugs and supplements, you just don't get the same effect as when you change your diet and address the root cause of the disease. Another reason he suggests is more plausible, and I agree with it, and that is that statin drugs, like all drugs, affect more than just cholesterol. Medications, he says, are, quote, chemical modifiers of cellular processes and complex biological systems like our body. In other words, what he's saying is that you can't just change one thing, cholesterol. If, cholesterol, if statin drugs are affecting cholesterol, they're affecting other things too. He basically goes on to say that as a result of this, health just does not come from pills. Amen. Couldn't have said it better. We need to get this guy with Esselstyn, and I think they'd be good friends. All right, that's all for today. And uh, as usual, feel free to pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it. And I'll be back to you again on Thursday.